Welcome everybody to our weekly Firefly community call. I'm um, excited to welcome Jim Zhang this week to talk about uh, plans for integrating Fabric into Firefly and how that will work together. And uh, there's a, a little bit of code that's been written on that. And uh, so, yeah, happy for, for Jim to share for the first part of today's community call. And then uh, like we've been doing in the past, we'll open it up in the second half for questions, comments, discussion, either on Fabric or on any other topic related to Firefly that people would like to discuss. So welcome. Thank you for being here. And I will hand it over to Jim. Thanks, Nico. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Jim. Um, so um, today's topic is how to make a um, connector so that uh, fabric-based uh, blockchains can work with Firefly. As you know, Firefly uh, historically started uh, with the support for Ethereum. Uh, and, and of course, we always had uh, uh, fabric uh, in the, uh, on the horizon. And uh, this is when uh, we're kicking off that effort. Um, so in the past few weeks, um, on and off, I've been um, uh, thinking about uh, what it takes to build a quality connector uh, that will serve uh, the purpose of uh, Firefly. Um, and this is really built on top of the, the framework that um, one of my co-founder for Kaleido, Peter Broadhurst, uh, has created for Ethereum side. Uh, even Ethereum and Fabric are very different kind of chains. The majority of the, the work that Peter did for Ethereum, and he was getting help from one of our um, protocol engineering leads, Vinod uh, Damali. Uh, so both of them have created this awesome piece of work uh, that's um, inside the Firefly Dash ETH Connect uh, repository. Um, and a lot of this can be borrowed over to support Fabric. So today's session is sort of half um, reviewing the framework uh, that was done there, um, and then half how to plug in the Fabric support. Um, so let's uh, let's get started. Um, so we have three diagrams here. Uh, the first one is sort of high level overview of the key components, and sort of just introduce the idea of a connector. Uh, what is a connector? Why do we need one? Uh, and what does it do? So um, uh, if you have written any programs against Fabric, uh, you probably have um, come across uh, one of the uh, SDKs. So there's a Node.js-based SDK, there's Go SDK, and there's even the Java SDK. Uh, they're awesome. So they allow you to, to package up uh, application uh, data into transactions, send them to peers, and then send them to, uh, to orderers so they can get uh, uh, mined into a block. Uh, that's great, but um, it's also a very um, uh, programming heavy uh, kind of experience for a developer that just want to talk to a fabric network so their business data can get into a block. It's a, it's a kind of a very large uh, threshold uh, of learning that you have to go through to even know what you're doing, um, you know, beyond, um, you know, spending a lot of time understanding the fabric uh, design itself. Um, more often than not, uh, when a enterprise developer approaches a enterprise application, in this case, a blockchain-based uh, enterprise application, when they think of backend, they think of APIs, right? Um, but uh, now we're saying, well, you have to learn this SDK. You have to learn all these calls that you need to make to, uh, to different pieces of a fabric network to do your stuff. So um, what if we give them instead a RESTful API you know, with uh, clear endpoints and JSON payloads? So they can do all that um, uh, much, easy, much more easily. So that's what this is for, uh, is uh, first and foremost, a, a REST API um, that stands in front of a fabric network. Uh, so you will want to dis, uh, deploy this in, in front of your own uh, peers and orderers. Um, so your applications can talk to fabric through REST. 
but it's much, much more than just the REST server. Um, because with enterprise comes um, a lot of additional requirements in terms of key management, um, uh, uh, delivery of messages and uh, fault tolerance when some of the components may go offline, especially in the modern uh, cloud-based uh, deployment. So we need some guarantee of um, uh, messages not getting lost um, if say your node is going offline, um, you don't want your application to have to, to compensate for that and then resend it. Uh, instead, we want um, all the messages to be, caught, uh, to be caught into a queue. So they will stay in the queue and then they will be drip fed into the, into the node on the other side. So even if the node for whatever reason goes away uh, before it comes back, all the transactions can continue to be submitted into the system, and they will just stay on the queue and waiting to be uh, to be submitted to the uh, to the blockchain. So, um, and then uh, you also want to, um, since this is now um, sort of a async experience, uh, you want to provide a storage of re of receipts. You know, basically saving the transaction result so that they can be queried uh, asynchronously. Um, so that's what this diagram is trying to show. Um, on the left-hand side, we have sort of high-level uh, API capabilities. Um, we've got to be able to manage identities. So <clears throat> uh, users can uh, call a post on the identities to, cr to create signing identities so that under the cover, we generate the client MSP uh, crypto materials, uh, get those to be registered and enrolled uh, with Fabric CA so that they can be used later on to submit transactions. So that's the first piece. Um, uh, and second is uh, we want at least two kinds of transaction submission. Uh, the obvious ones is I just want request response my application doesn't really have a lot of transactions going through every day. So I'm okay just sending one at a time, wait for the whole thing to be completed. And then I, I get on the response, the execution results. So that's, that's just re, uh, request and wait and, and, uh, for response. So that's sort of the synchronous uh, API that we've got to provide. Um, but if your application um, is going to have um, many more transactions on a single second to be submitted and you want to submit those uh, and then wait for the result, you don't want to be held, you don't want the, um, uh, the thread to be held open, so you want an as asynchronous uh, experience. So we want to just acknowledge the submission uh, and then track the completion of the um, uh, transaction uh, asynchronously and then store the result in some sort of database so that they can be queried. So the application will send uh, and get the acknowledging the response that it's been successfully sent and taken by this connector. And then it'll sort of just keep polling on the, um, uh, on, the, on the result for that particular transaction by some sort of ID that we generate for them. So now we will have both sync, synchronous and asynchronous kind of uh, transaction submissions for different kinds of uh, use case scenarios. And finally, um, we, we have to uh, provide some sort of uh, event streaming. Uh, this is very useful in, in several uh, use cases. Um, I know Fabric supports um, uh, um, CouchDB based uh, state store, uh, which provides excellent query capability. Uh, but um, querying on the state database itself directly can be uh, less efficient because the state has absolutely everything that the node uh, catches. So uh, query performance may be hindered if you know, all you need is one piece of information, but you have to sort through, you know, uh, thousands of other pieces that uh, you know that are happening in channels that not related to you, um, and also um, uh, given the the design of the schema, 
that's catering to the fabric internals querying against this kind of database directly may not be uh, as sufficient. So what you want to do is you want to build a offline uh, transaction, <coughs> excuse me, offline transaction cache um, that uh, has just the transactions that your application are interested in um, based on the, the events uh, that the Fabric node sends out uh, when the transactions are mining to block. So you want a, a stream of events coming out of the um, uh, a pipe leading from the Fabric node going into a sink and then you can take that and, and uh, store it in your own database uh, that's dedicated to your, your application and you can query, you can set up a schema according to the application's needs and that will be the, the most favorable way to cache transaction results. So um, it will be very useful for this connector to provide event streaming and not just catching the latest blocks, but you can tell uh, this event uh, streaming uh, management, I want to start from block zero, or I want to start from block 1000 or 10,000, whatever. And then going from that uh, block on, give me all the events that are related to, you know, uh, by a reg, um, regular expression kind of pattern by name, whatever, right? So that's the kind of event streaming um, uh, uh, capabilities that we're looking for here. And then finally, in terms of delivering that to the client, uh, we want both a WebSocket based uh, streaming um, uh, channels, but maybe uh, for certain scenarios, a, a webhook based uh, delivery of events might be useful. Maybe the, the client is deployed in the zone that uh, you know, because of the networking conditions, um, uh, WebSocket kind of long living uh, connections may not be optimal. A webhook uh, based um, uh, endpoints deliver events might be necessary there. So we want to kind of uh, provide both. So um, I've covered sort of the high level things. Now, uh, Kafka is going to be the queue that's um, that's going to be used to um, to implement this uh, queue, so that you know for the async kind of submissions, we want uh, the all the messages to be sent to a Kafka queue. Um, we want to use one uh, at least one topic. It turns out that we should have uh, at least two topics that we'll cover in the net, one of the next um, uh, uh, diagrams, uh, but. A, a Kafka topic uh, on the per node basis should be created. And then uh, based on how many channels you may have, we can have different partitions dedicated to different channels uh, because Kafka only guarantees um, a, a sequence or ordering on the partition per partition basis. So we should use a partition to be paired with a channel. So all the transaction submissions uh, when they get submitted to the block, uh, to the nodes, they don't, they don't go out of order. So that's sort of the high level uh, overview of, um, of the current thinking. Um, are there any questions from, from the audience at this point? I, I actually have a quick question, Jim. Sure. Uh, so you start off saying, uh, you're sharing a lot of similarities and at least thinking and design from Firefly ETH Connect. Uh, with, with Firefly ETH Connect, it is possible to run with or without Kafka. Yes. Uh, in this design, does uh, yes. Fab Connect require it? Is it a requirement or is there another mode you can run in without Kafka as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So that sort of uh, 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 segues into our next diagram. Cool. So there are. Um, Unless there are other questions on the previous diagram, we'll, we'll just continue here. Sounds like no. Okay, so uh, there are three ways for a transaction to go through the system. And uh, each uh, sort of life cycle requires its own components. So to directly answer your question, no, Kafka is not uh, absolutely required. 
you can you can configure the system to only do uh, synchronous, only do asynchronous, or do both synchronous and asynchronous. And on the asynchronous side, uh, we have also two kinds of asynchronous tracking of uh, transaction lifecycle. Uh, we call it direct handler or Kafka-based handler. Um, we'll talk about the details, you know, uh, why they're different, why do we need both. But uh, let's go through the synchronous lifecycle and, and see what are the pieces um, we need to build to support that. So uh, as a reminder, a synchronous lifecycle is uh, as an application, I'm sending a transaction you know, with a JSON payload uh, to this endpoint, specify my chain code, my uh, parameters, uh, and my channel. And then I'm just going to wait so that when the response finally comes back, I expect to see um, the transaction results um, after the transaction has been mined into a block. So uh, to support this kind of um, life cycle, we want to build a synchronous dispatcher. So uh, correspondingly, there should be an asynchronous dispatcher. So synchronous dispatcher will you know, directly call this sort of the heart of the, the, the connector. We call it transaction processor. Uh, so it's able to translate a JSON payload and then understand what you're trying to do. Uh, what's the channel, what's the uh, chain code method, and what are the parameters, and then package that into a payload that uh, Fabric nodes uh, will understand. And then go through the um, uh, SDK to submit that into, into the network. Uh, by the way, I uh, haven't mentioned that <clears throat> we plan to use Go language, uh, Golang. Uh, as a programming language to implement this. Um, and um, because of that, we're gonna build on top of the work um, that um, you know, Ron, um, yeah, I think it's Rhonda um, uh, has uh, done from um, a secure key. So with the Fabric uh, SDK Go. So, um, yeah, this transaction processor will uh, take the message and then uh, change it into a, a transaction object and then submit that into the client uh, and call execute uh, uh, method on the client. So that'll submit the transaction into, uh, into a Fabric uh, network, you know, first contacting the peers and then um, collecting all the endorsement and send it to the orderer. Eventually, um, getting the event um, to signal that the transaction has been mined into a block. So this tr uh, transaction tracking uh, will, um, will package the reply and then send it back to the uh, dispatcher. And then uh, the response handler will give uh, the response back to the client. So that's sort of the simplest way to have a uh, request response based um, transaction lifecycle. So now let's talk about the async um, lifecycle now. So on submission, we want to immediately acknowledge, okay, we've got your message. You intend to invoke some transaction. Um, we can do that for you. And acknowledge back, um, here's the ID you can use to keep track of this transaction to see where it's at uh, on this journey uh, to the blockchain and back. So a unique ID will be generated uh, to the client in the response uh, acknowledgement so that <clears throat> um, this will uh, represent this unique message uh, throughout the journey. And next, um, we want something that'll uh, be res responsible for uh, keeping track of the whole life cycle of this uh, transaction. So first we'll talk about a direct handler. What we call a direct handler is basically in memory uh, um, queue of transactions that are uh, basically in flight. So we'll use Go routines, each de dedicated to a uh, message or a transaction to track it all the way through. So um, we will uh, maintain a in-memory in-flight 
uh, transaction list. And you can tune based on some tuning uh, parameters, how many you'd like to uh, be in flight, um, you know, based on your expected transaction load, you can dial it up or down. Uh, and based on, you know, how big your peer node is, what's the likely sort of submission rate uh, onto the node you can, you can support. Uh, you can configure the uh, number of transactions that should be uh, in flight. And then uh, this will then <clears throat> again go through the transaction processor and then send it to, to the chain and listen for events. So all that is, is still the same. And finally, when a transaction is tracked to be uh, confirmed and event is now fired, uh, it'll go back to the transaction handler and say, okay, I've got the uh, result and let's save it in the uh, receipt store. So it'll be available for query. Uh, so that's all in memory. Um, obviously, it's got no uh, fault tolerance if you know the the uh, the um, if the uh, connector node goes away. You know we have you know in the cloud era we always need to design our software to be as you know as much fault tolerant as possible. So we want to ha also have a Kafka based um, uh, option. Obviously, this will be more expensive to configure, to deploy, and to, to operate, but you know, it has to be there for the enterprise kind of usages. So what this is, is it's going to be a queue that'll you know, cache uh, all the transactions. And then on the other hand, the consumers will take them off of the queue, submit it to the, to the transaction processor, again, go through that uh, lifecycle tracking. And eventually, when it comes back, the event will also be thrown back onto the queue uh, into a different uh, topic. So this is sort of the two topics per node thing we're talking about earlier. And then um, it will be, again, picked off of that queue uh, by a consumer and then process it and save it into uh, the receipt store for uh, query uh, later. And um, the Kafka-based um, handler has a bit more details here. So we want two topics. One topic, uh, one Kafka topic responsible for handling all the requests. So that's on the way in. This, this is all the requests uh, that are taken from the submission. And then the consumer uh, of this topic will then submit those to the transaction processors, which submits to the peer. And when eventually the event is uh, emitted by the peer, uh, we want to put the event onto a different topic, we call it receipts. Uh, and the consumer of that receipt will uh, then um, process it and then saves it in the receipt store. Uh, which makes it available for query. So that's sort of the all the details uh, for the transaction lifecycle uh, tracking. The last topic is event stream. Uh, before before we dive into that, uh, I'd like to pause here and see if there's any questions. Yeah, <clears throat> Jan Rock had a great question. Uh, what is the reason to prefer REST instead of gRPC? Uh, proto buff streaming API security speed all solved already with gRPC. Uh, the streaming of gRPC. Uh, sorry, I am. Um, uh, so so I, think the question, I think the question is why did we go with REST as the front door mm. instead of gRPC? Yeah, um, I understand gRPC is more efficient given you know its binary uh, payload and is faster and it's also has. Um, um, uh, full, you know, uh, full duplex uh, kind of connections. But I think REST is just sort of the expected norm uh, for application uh, development. You know, it's very uh, likely when you talk to a uh, enterprise um, solution developer, application developer, they would expect REST more, more than, you know, more than gRPC. It's just much easier to, to use REST plus JSON rather than um, REST plus um, uh, gRPC. But on the other hand, um, 
you know, with certain systems, maybe gRPC, only gRPC can give you the kind of um, performance you expect. So uh, we definitely welcome the community to contribute um, additional uh, support for gRPC. I think that that totally makes sense. So I don't know if there's other uh, input from yeah, the I, I just, just conscious. Um, there was a second part of that was this idea that um, gRPC already handles the streaming. Um, uh, I, I think it's worth noting um, Kafka in this architecture isn't being used for streaming as such. It's, it's being used as a reliable fault tolerant persistent yep. buffer. Yep. So the application can sort of say set yep. and be done, yep. right? Uh, and, and it will reliably become set. It's not just put it into a gRPC buffer and if it falls over, um, it has to recover, it has to use its own state to work out where it's gone. It's got it as far as Kafka, at least what's delivery means it's going to get into the gRPC buffer of, of, um, of Fabric. So, so the intention here is taking away all of the significant comp complexity that having a gRPC buffer on the other end of something places on an application developer. Right? It, it, it's about taking that complexity away. It's not about saying it's not valuable. It's, it, 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 it's valuable. It's just, it's just this, this kind of app. Like basically, everyone has to build this. You want to do reliable, reliable streaming of transactions in the fabric. You, you, you need one of these. Um, so, I mean, we, we know projects that have built it on, on fabric, Jim, don't we? So, um, so yeah. like, it's just, it's just, again, it's about just sort of saying, you don't need to build this, take it away from the application developer having to worry about this. And they just say, here's a JSON input of my transaction inputs, mm -hmm. get the signatures you need, make it, make it so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for the additional input, Peter. So that's uh, Peter Brothers uh, himself there. Um, and I guess uh, just spending another minute on the possible relay question to Kafka. Why do we even need Kafka if Fabric itself is a fault tolerant kind of uh, design already? Well, this is mainly um, uh, accounting for uh, ingestion uh, rate. So Fabric is super fast, right? Uh, it can get up to uh, a thousand uh, per second, but you can totally have a system that uh, uh, can still overrun fabric even in that uh, scenario. And I think Kafka is is great for that. You know, can easily catch a million transactions per second. Plus, it's also a enterprise friendly kind of components. A lot of enterprises have like direct hooks into Kafka um, uh, to. Uh, to do that. And, and the other aspect with this is, um, at least as of now, uh, 2.3, uh, you would have to contact, you know, a whole bunch of fabric nodes first, collect the information, and then submit the, the result to the, uh, to the fabric uh, um, order. So there are many steps involved uh, for a transaction to get, finally get into fabric. So all that is now taken care of behind the, the uh, Kafka consumer. So the applications don't have to uh, uh, manage that. Um, so I, I understand uh, 2.4 is expected to have the submitting peer. So that's complexity sort of is taken, taken care of, but still uh, because of the uh, fault tolerant um, and uh, you know, the rate of submission, requirements, a Kafka is going to be very valuable for a lot of scenarios. Thank you, Jim. Peter, um, just to be mindful of time, we're about 30 minutes into the call. So, um, and, and thank you to Jan for the great question and for volunteering to get involved to, to integrate gRPC. So I guess we didn't get to uh, talk about um, event stream. Uh, we can, you know, do a few minutes in the next call or, you know, we can engage uh, through rocket chat. Um, or if, if you've got just a few more minutes, I think we can uh, finish the topic here. We, we've kind of, we've led into, yeah, the, led into the, the Q and A there. Um, sure. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Um, okay. So the last bit of uh, uh, 
the architecture here is the event stream. <clears throat> this is very different than just listening, subscribing to events after you've submitted a transaction. This is about maybe the chain has already gone through a million blocks and I'm a late joiner into the, into the network. And I'd like to be replayed of all the events that has happened up to now. Um, so, you know, I can build my application logic. And so I don't miss any of the significant historical events. So that's one scenario. You know, I'd like to be given all the, all the events that has happened in the past, plus listening to on, ongoing events. So that's one scenario. The other is, again, what I mentioned, I like to hook sort of a pipe leading out, the, out of the fabric node into my own database so I can build my own query schema uh, to, uh, to serve my application's needs. So um, what we need to do here is, first of all, we need a uh, subscription manager. We need to ask the client, what kind of um, events are you interested in? Is it all events, block events, uh, transaction events, or transaction events named in certain patterns? So I can create a subscription so that whenever any events that's matching this pattern comes through, I like to be notified and I want to see the details of that event. And in terms of getting delivered uh, the event uh, details, I want to uh, uh, have the option of creating a long-lived um, uh, WebSocket connection, or I, I can host a uh, secure uh, webhook endpoint. So you can just send those to the webhook by posting to, to this endpoint. Um, so we have a event stream manager that'll, um, um, that'll allow the client to create these event streams that will be tied to one or more event subscriptions and each event stream when it kicked off will you know uh, pull from the uh, blockchain uh, either from the latest block or from the uh, the block zero or from certain block uh, that you specify and replay all the events since then uh, whenever every each event is delivered, it'll look through the manager and see which client are interested uh, in this event based on the sub subscription, find the configured way to deliver the event to that particular client, and then send it there. So that's basically what, um, what e event stream capability does uh, here. So I think that's all I had prepared uh, in terms of the architecture. Um, so now let's see if the audience has any any questions. Cool. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, we opened up for discussion and questions either on Fabric or anything. Anything. Firefly. Firefly yeah. up to date. Actually, I'm going to take the screen share off for now. Good idea. Uh, so I can see if people are. <clears throat> Not everybody all at once here. Oh, sorry, uh, a correction. I just remember uh, it was eluding me. It was Troy, Troy Ronda uh, from Secure Key. He's the creator of the SDK now. Sorry, Troy. For some reason, I just couldn't remember the first name. Uh, BJ, uh, uh, BJ says, Jim, thanks for the insights. Is it possible to walk through an exception scenario? Ah, great question. Great question. Let me go back to the screen. Yeah, I'll let you fill it. <laughs> you can share your screen. <laughs> All right. OK, so I guess there are two kinds of uh, except, well, at least two. Maybe there are more. Uh, one is uh, on submission, for whatever reason, maybe the this particular uh, connector is being uh, overrun or is having networking issue, um, you know, it, it, submission failed, right? So uh, straightforward. Uh, the response says, sorry, I didn't take your transaction, try again. Uh, more tricky is when something went wrong uh, along the journey after it's been submitted. So let's say um, 
the the fabric node itself uh, is um, is beyond uh, reach uh, at the moment. So that this this execute call failed, right? So um, the the transaction processor will have you know the go routine that's fired off to to keep track of that particular transaction will have retry logic so that if it's a uh, either 404, 503, that shows that the endpoint is not available at the point at the moment, it'll just retry. So there's going to be some exponential back off kind of logic to, uh, to make sure everybody don't retry all at once. Um, and then uh, it can also fail because the transaction itself is, is invalid. Uh, but that's uh, that doesn't really change the the flow at all. So the transaction will still come through, and uh, there's an event of the transaction fading, and it'll be recorded uh, in the receipt store as a failed transaction. So the application will query for that. So instead of seeing a successful transaction, we'll see a failed transaction. And uh, Fabric is great in telling you exactly how it failed. I think it's got like. 30 or 40 different uh, status code that tells you why the transaction failed. And the application can, you know, uh, can uh, take care of that uh, uh, by inspecting the, the error code. So I think that may well be all the exception scenarios. I don't know if um, VJ, you had something more in mind? Okay, sounds like that was that was okay there. Okay. So I guess again, all questions related to fireflies is um, fair game here. Doesn't have to be fabric specific. Okay, Young has another question. When a task backlog will be created and where? How can I, oh, ah, okay, good question. Um, if you wanna contribute, uh, we're still in the early days of uh, coding things up. I'm hoping the first code drop will happen in the next couple of days. So what I'm doing right now is just sort of setting up the, the basic uh, skeleton of these components. Uh, so you can have a overview of all the pieces uh, that are involved and how they uh, relate to each other. And then uh, uh, over time, we'll fill in the implementation. So that's where I am. Um, I'm hoping to be able to uh, drop the first commit soon, and then I'll start creating a, a backlog um, of, you know, this piece needs to be implemented, that piece needs to be implemented, uh, hopefully soon. Um, yeah. yeah, and GitHub issues will be the place to find all of those. We're trying to use GitHub as much as we can. Uh, some of the projects that have been up there mm -hmm. for a little bit longer have uh, a healthy backlog going now, uh, but obviously this one is brand new. So uh, it will take a little bit of time to fill that out, but that's that's where they will be. And that, that's our goal to, uh, to kind of document the both the things we know we need to do or uh, and kind of the, the, the plans for where we want, uh, where we envision the projects going as well. Yeah. And um, Jan, if you are really um, uh, looking forward to starting this, I think the identity, um, the submitting identity, uh, um, the signing identity, sorry, piece might be a independent enough piece in all of this. Uh, so basically what we want is a um, component that can generate um, uh, can generate certificates, generate the client a common connection profile so that we can bootstrap a client MSP instance that then can be used uh, to submit transactions. So the kind of uh, uh, APIs we need for that is post to identities giving it a username and then it'll call, register, and enroll with Fabric CA, and then it'll generate a um, uh, a wallet basically on the file system. 
that can be later on used um, to load in the signing keys. Uh, I feel like that that's a um, pretty independent piece of work that can be uh, started uh, right away. So if you're interested, we can uh, discuss more um, uh, uh, in Rocket Chat. Yeah, we're definitely super excited to have more people get involved in these. Um, so if you're interested, uh, let's let's keep up the conversation and uh, happy to meet more offline to talk about specifics on some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hope to hear your voice in the in the future call. Uh, definitely uh, very excited to uh, to have you um, uh, interested and, and want to contribute here. Uh, hope we can talk soon over uh, uh, over Rocket. All right, so I guess if there are no other questions, we can get back 60 minutes. Yeah, take uh, last call for questions. I haven't seen any more pop up. Should we consider adding a process for dead letter queue on the Kafka side or leave it to the developers to implement that? That's a question from VJ. Mm. Peter, did you have any input to, uh, to that? So, um, uh, so I guess I'm going to refer to the, to the Ethereum side of this where we've done it and had um, Many, many, many millions of, um, of transactions gone through through this infrastructure in production sort of over the last three years. Because um, that and um, what it, the, the approach there is that um, if there's a problem um, processing a, a transaction and submitting it, that this infrastructure doesn't doesn't stop the world. Um, it, it's, it says, look, I'm going to, developer, you're going to say, please send this transaction. And I'm going to give you an identifier, right? I'm going to give you a placeholder for submission of that. And I'm going to give you that straight away. And I promise eventually to either give you a yes, I've sent that transaction event, or I promise to give you I've failed for that, for that um, event. Um, but I don't promise that um, if you've done something wrong, which is where you need to have that execute, right? Which is, if you've done something wrong, I'm going to try to like stop the world to not process anything after that. So if you, if you as a, as a submitter of, of, of transactions to Fabric, um, if you have a requirement that this transaction must be mined, before this transaction. Otherwise, like I've broken, I've broken my, my on-chain state if I if I try to submit transaction number two before transaction number one is submitted, then you need to wait for it to go all the way through and come, come back as an application developer. The, the system would um, will will attempt and to, your, to the sort of dead letter queue processing you would normally have done in messaging, it's it, it tries for a period of time, it tries, there's lots of error handling, and et cetera, sort of all done for Ethereum and still on the plate for Fabric around, well, okay, I need to, I don't know, I need to get, uh, I've looked at the, the um, policy for this channel and I need five signatures um, to get, um, I need five signatures because um, there's 10 parties um, and I need 50%. So I'm going to, going to try and find five parties and I'm going to try and get signatures. There should be in the configuration and probably lots of configuration policies on like, how long am I going to try for? What if nobody's available? What if I can only get to four? How long do I wait for the fifth? And, um, and it should be that the policy isn't, I'm just going to wait forever, right? Because maybe this channel is just broken at the moment. It can't, there's, there's actually only four, no, four nodes up. There's not five nodes up. Um, the system should reliably try for a period of time. If it crashes, it will restart. It will come back to, to, to a sensible point. It will deal with making sure it sort of guides it through. But if it really can't do it after, I don't know, 
some really long time, like two minutes, it's trying. And it's just like, there's no way I can get the signatures needed. The, 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 the approach so far has been to say, right, well, you'll get a failure. And then in the Firefly core side, the transaction object then gets updated as a failure. And there's also um, associated with the transaction object, um, which, with, um, sorry, associated with like if you were trying to send a message or you do a token transfer or whatever, there's a concept of an operation, which is, is, is like this bit went wrong. Well, I couldn't submit the on-chain transaction as part of the token transfer, but maybe I sent the message, the, the, the data offline. That operation then would go into a failed state. And the idea is then as, it, as, a, as an operator, you'd see that it's in a failed state. And the UI has operations like, um, this is TBD, but on the UI side, you'd see operations in a broken state and you'd be able to resubmit them there. So, um, sorry, that was a bit of a long, a long description, but like the model is not um, stop the world, which is where you need that to The model is, I'm gonna do my best I'm going to do like not like you could have written a thousand lines of reliably try and get transactions into fabric code yourself, but here's a community that's written the best job that they can do do for you with reliability, crash fault tolerance, all the like. If it can't do it, still there are error cases where you might still have to get errors back in your application. Yep, thanks, Peter. Uh, definitely the, the, the expert on uh, enterprise queues and messaging. <laughs> so, yeah, if, uh, if you guys have uh, any other questions, so uh, fantastic questions so far, uh, we're always available on uh, Rocket Chat. I just pasted the link there. Uh, the, the channel is called Firefly uh, Lab. So, uh, always welcome any questions from that. Okay, so thanks, Peter. Super. Thanks, CJ. Yep. Thanks, VJ. That, that was great questions. All right, we have nine minutes left. Any other questions? Good discussion today. Yep. Do, do you think this is a really exciting piece of work? Um, uh, and this component, maybe just one last thing. This component, like, um, once we've got two legs of the stool, right? We, we're, Corda's a little bit further behind, but I go have a look at the Corda Connector because there's loads of code there. There's some architectural challenges still to solve. But like we've got Ethereum and Fabric at this layer. The intention then is that we can prove the layer on top in Firefly, but it isn't just like simple transactions and token transactions. It's, it's any transaction, like make just, you know, you can have custom transactions and that layer in the, in the Firefly core can exist. And I know there's been lots of questions since Firefly, we started talking about it on TSC calls and the like, of what about, what about my custom on-chain logic? And we didn't want to declare success on that at the core layer, just because we've got it at the Ethereum layer, because until you've proven something with two blockchain technologies, and Jim's been making the point to me a lot, like, you, you can't prove an orchestration layer that's meant to work across multiple protocols unless you've got two protocols. So I think this is really exciting. I'm really pleased to see the, the collaboration and, 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 and the leadership here to, to just kind of get the fabric, the fabric leg of a stool yep. on board. Yep, absolutely. All right, you guys, uh, thanks so much for showing up today and um, uh, hope to, to continue to engage with you guys on this uh, piece of work uh, through Rocket Chat, through email, whatever. And then on subsequent community calls, if you have questions, we'd be, um, we'd be really happy to entertain. All right, thank you, Jim. Thanks thank for the, the work you're doing on this and thank you for presenting today, I really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for uh, joining for this community call. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now and we'll wrap up, thanks.